we have it's time for today's webinar, but we'll give it a couple minutes for people to roll in. It's three minutes past the hour. We'll give it about one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. Problem. So, welcome. I'm Mike Riddle, Executive Vice President here at NCAB America. And today we're gonna to be talking about OPGW Engineering 201, its accessories. And I consider it 201 because this is going to assume that you have some basic familiarity with OPGW cable. But before we get into all of that, let's go through some required slides. So we are, registered with RCEP in order to give out uh, continuing education credits. So we met, met those standards and we report successful completion of this webinar on their website, rcep.net. And, and you will get a certificate of completion for completing this uh, if you choose to. Uh, this does not mean that RCEP RCEP endorses or approves of the content of this. It just means that we're consistent with their presentation standards. As I mentioned earlier, this is OPGW Engineering 201 and accessories are important because without the accessories, you don't have a complete system. We'll give special attention to dead ends and suspension since those are especially critical components but we'll talk about basically almost everything you might use. Here are the specific learning objectives. So we we'll want you to know the three basic OPGW dead end types. We'll explain what tension coupling is and why that's important for dead ends. Talk about the basic types of OPGW suspensions and the advantages and disadvantages of each. We'll confirm when to use a single suspension, a double suspension, or a running dead end. Talk about the two types of vibration dampers for OPGW, and again, the advantages and disadvantages of each. We'll talk about the three basic types of splice enclosures and the considerations that go into selecting a good one. And we'll identify and briefly discuss some other important items that your project might need. Here are some basic uh, rules for the webinar. We've already done the introduction and sound check. The presentation itself will last about 60 minutes. During the presentation, you may use chat for questions. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, well, like Natasha, who's acting as like my facilitator, maybe can answer some questions and uh, some of the other NCAP staff might be on and be able to answer questions. Uh, don't worry if your question doesn't get asked because I can pick it up at the Q&A at the end. But during the Q&A, we don't want any business, you know, like your specific, uh, like maybe an order that you have in progress with NCAB or anything like that. We want to stick to the technical uh, questions related to OPGW accessories only. And so that's enough of the ground rules. Let's get started. So first, I need to review the three basic types of OPGW that are used today. In a few slides, you'll see why this is important. But just to orient you, there are center tube designs. So you have a center stainless steel tube, which could be plain, like you see in this particular version of this design concept, or it might be with aluminum, like you see in this version. The aluminum could be clad onto the stainless steel tube, or the stainless steel tube could just be inserted into an aluminum pipe. So there are two uh, variants of, of this design concept, but the concept is still the same, a center stainless steel tube with aluminum around it. You have the aluminum pipe type design. This is where you have a, a larger aluminum pipe or tube with plastic buffer tubes in the center that house the fibers. And then you have a stranded design. So you take that stainless steel tube and instead of putting it in the center, you strand it around a center element. 
uh, which might be an aluminum clad steel wire as shown in this particular illustration, but it could also be aluminum alloy. It just depends upon uh, the specific design. And you might have one tube or you might have several, depends on the design, but this is the stranded design concept. So center tube designs, aluminum pipe type designs, and stranded designs. So general point about OPGW accessories is that all of them are designed specifically for OPGW. And in particular, they are specially designed to limit the radial pressure on the cable. That's important, right? Because in all of these cables, you got fiber somewhere uh, inside that cable. So you need to limit radial pressure Never use any type of a compression fitting like you might use on a cutter. But the fittings that have a sleeve and you use a press to press them on place, that's the type of fitting I'm talking about. And you can't even use standard clamps like pistol grips for a conductor, even standard suspension shoes are not suitable for use on OPGW the ones that you would use on conventional overhead ground wire or conductor. You have to use accessories that are specifically designed for use on OPGW. And because you're trying to limit radial pressure on the cable, one consequence of that is that the accessories tend to have a very limited diameter range. It tends to be small, so you have to carefully select those items. The typical lead time for OPGW accessories, if they have to be made, sometimes they're in stock, but you need to plan for it being about six to eight weeks, especially if you're buying a significant quantity. So you need to plan accordingly. Now, now just a couple notes before we continue. Uh, I've used a lot of pictures throughout this presentation. Uh, I've shamelessly copied and pasted them from whatever I found on the uh, internet. And um, I probably, you know, if I was a scholar, I would have given attributions to everything. And, but in this case, I'll just give a general thank you for those that don't mind me copying and pasting their pictures. And I apologize for the ones that do. I'm also going to inject the a green check mark for items that I think are the best in their category. So if this is the coveted Mike Riddle preferred item rating. Uh, that and ten dollars will buy you a tall latte at Starbucks, but it's just my opinion. Uh, unless I say otherwise, an item is fine, but those are the ones that I think are the best in their particular category. So here's a pictorial overview of how accessories are used with OPGW. You can see up at the top, you can have your uh, dead ends. Got three choices there. You can have suspensions, two choices there. You might also have a support. We'll talk about that in brief briefly. When you have dead ends and you're splicing, you'll have your down lead clamps and a splice case. Uh, you might also have a bullet resistant housing and cable storage. We'll talk about those as well. Uh, mid span, uh, you might have dampers. SVDs, spiral vibration dampers, or stock bridge dampers, and you could even have an airflow, airflow spoiler, and we'll talk about all of those as we continue. So this is a pictorial representation, and here it is spelled out. So the dead ends, I mentioned three basic options, the wedge type, bolted, and formed wire, we'll talk about each. Suspensions, AGS, armor grip suspension, uh, are bolted. We'll talk about the no rod variant of the bolted concept. Talk about double suspensions, how to connect. So all of these have to be connected to a hardware. So, or excuse me, have to be connected to the tower. So we'll talk about that. Talk about grounding, dampers I mentioned, down lead clamps, splice enclosures, and then some other important items. So this looks like a lot. But don't worry, we're going to break everything down so you can relax. You'll understand it all and know how to make an informed decision what to choose. 
first stop, dead ends, and you see right away this particular type or so bolt type gets the much coveted Mike Riddle preferred item rating. And when you're looking at a dead end, the key concept that you need to understand is the coupling zone. Fundamentally, with the dead end, what you have to do is couple the tension that's in the cable through the dead end to the connecting hardware and to the structure. So the area over which you do that, I'm calling the coupling zone, or you could think of it as the tension transition zone. In this particular dead end type, that occurs over this complete distance. It's called a wedge dead end because inside this outer housing that you can see, you can't see very well, but there's a little conical wedge piece in here, and that's providing much of your holding strength. In addition, or working in cooperation with these retaining rods, which for the general range of OPGW are typically 30 to 36 inches. So let's just say about three feet. So you, you have an entire roughly three feet that you're spreading that tension transition across. And that, as a cable designer, that's good for my cable. So I like that. This design concept, as I point out at the bottom, uh, is, a, 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 um, is derived from a type of dead end that was used for holding wire rope cables on bridges. So it's quite strong. It has these advantages. It balances your installation time uh, with that tension coupling. So we'll, what we'll see is that on uh, the next type of dead end, that the tension coupling is over a longer distance. And so that's even better for the cable, but that makes that type of dead end harder to install. So you're trading off a little bit of the coupling zone for a little bit of ease of installation. And I think this design type gives you the best balance there. Uh, good value, so they're reasonably priced. Good availability, you can get them when you need them. Uh, disadvantages, in terms of performance, none, but there in the United States, there is only one supplier of this particular type of dead end. So, there's a variant of the wedge type that looks like this, where the wedge slides and it slides over the entire distance that it's applied to the cable. Uh, this is claimed to be easier to install. I don't really know. So um, I will put a question mark there on that, but it has some significant disadvantages. Uh, there are no rods used to protect the cable. And I will talk more about rods later. Uh, it's got a much shorter coupling zone. So it's not three feet. Uh, from what I've seen of these, it's less than even two, might be 18 inches or so. And in reality, in theory, you're spreading that tension transition over the entire length of the wedge. But with this type of dead end, the reality in the field is that the wedge doesn't seat uh, and transition the tension perfectly across the wedges, it tends to concentrate towards the mouth. And as a consequence of that, my opinion, uh, it's led to slippage in the field. It's not my opinion that it's led to slippage in the field. It has led to slippage in the field. My opinion is the reason why it's led to slippage in the field. It's not really developing its full holding strength because it's holding too well here, but not well enough in the back. That part is my opinion, but it's not an opinion. It's a fact that these have slipped in the field. It's also a fact that it offers a very short coupling zone, which is not as good for my cable, so I don't like it. Uh, limited sources for this, basically you're sole sourcing it. They tend to be expensive. And if you ever have to take one off to move it or adjust it, you have to buy a special tool. Now, I know that the lineman will say, well, golly gee, I can use a chisel and a hammer. I can get that puppy right off. Yes, but of course you're likely to damage the cable in the process. So I don't like these. They get the Mike Riddle uh, kiss of death, shall we say. 
So the next category of dead ends is the formed wire type. Same concept as a guide grip. For OPGW, there is first a layer of structural reinforcing rods put on the cable. And then you're applying the actual dead end, really a big guide grip, over top of that layer of structural reinforcing rods. So from a holding standpoint, that's just great. You've got a lot of protection for the cable and you have a coupling zone that's on the order of four to five feet. Can be a little bit more sometimes, can be a little bit less, but in general, it's around that. So it's longer than the U-bolt wedge type, um, which is good, but that makes it much difficult to install, right? Because you got two sets of rods that are long to put on, so it's gonna add significant amount of time. And because it's so long, you may not be able to install it from a pole. So you're gonna have to have a bucket truck or something else. So a line may can't climb a pole and install it from there. He's gotta have additional equipment to install it. But it does have some advantages. In terms of the tension coupling, it's the best of the three types that we're gonna talk about. You can buy it from a lot of different companies. It has excellent availability, maybe in stock at a distributor, and it's quite inexpensive. So it does have its advantages and there are a lot of utilities that use these. Nothing wrong with it. It's a very good dead end. The third type of dead end is the so-called bolted type. Now, the advantage, of, well, let me explain it first. So in a bolted type, you've got a frame uh, where you have a series of keepers. This particular one has six. There might be uh, one or one or so fewer, maybe one or so more, depending upon the particular manufacturer and the cable design that it's been designed for. Your coupling zone is across these, these keepers. The first one is often different, not always, but often. In this particular picture, this first set of keepers has a neoprene grommet, which is intended to prevent aeolian vibration damage. The keeper have shear head bolts on it. What that means is they get to a certain torque and then they shear off. And that's supposed to let you know that you've installed the bolt to the proper torque. The advantages of this type of dead end are that it's claimed to be faster to install. Now, I've had doubts about that for a long time. Uh, when I tried to do it myself, I didn't find it was significantly faster at all but uh, I don't do installed ends every day. So someone could say, well, I was just not fully competent doing it. So what, what good is my opinion? Well, it's just, it's my opinion. But conceptually consider the following. In order to install this, you have to loosen all the bolts on one side about a half an inch. You got to get enough for the cable to be able to uh, slide into the groove. The bolts on on the other side have to be completely loosened, so on the order of about an inch, so that they are not engaged in the hole underneath at all, so that the cable can slide in and into the center groove. So you got to do that. Then you have to tighten bolts three times. So you don't just go zip, zip. Instead, you're supposed to go zip, crisscross, uh, and I say zip, Tighten partially, tighten partially, tighten partially, tighten partially, tighten partially, tighten partially, and then go back down. Tighten, 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 tighten. Repeat. Tighten, 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 a little more. Tighten, 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 a little more. And then third pass, fully tighten so that the head shears off. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. You got to do that. That's the way you're supposed to do it in order for the dead end to develop full holding strength. So is it really faster? I don't know. You do have multiple sources for these, and so there is good availability. So there, there are advantages to it. The disadvantages, though, it's got the worst 
first tension coupling of all of the dead ends that we've talked about on the order of 10 to 12 inches. So I, as a cable designer, don't really like that. They tend to be expensive. And it's been my experience that many crews do not tighten the bolts as I showed you how they're supposed to be tightened. And the, that, that method is what's written in the installation instructions. But of course, what crews do is they get a ratchet and zip and zip and they think they're done. And when you do that, you won't have full holding strength. And in many cases, what you'll have is the keepers will be cocked and it will be noticeable. Um, and you'll know that you know, that dead end is not going to develop its full holding strength. If you do that and you notice that the keepers are cocked and then you say, oh, well, shoot. Um, what I did cause the shear heads to shear off prematurely. What do I do now? Well, you have two choices. You can go get a torque wrench, and now you have to be very precise in tightening them, uh, or you can buy replacement bolts. And I've seen customers do both, and it just becomes a a, a hassle for everybody involved. It's a, a, admittedly a minor hassle, but it's a hassle nonetheless, and don't we all want our lives to be a little bit easier? So officially, these are okay. But as you can tell, I don't really like them a whole lot. Moving on, suspension clamp. So first up is bolted. Again, this particular type gets the Mike Riddle approval seal. But the, the point here, or the general point about suspension clamps is that in my opinion, all suspension clamps should use armor rods. Again, I'm gonna talk about that more in a moment. I know I keep saying that, but I really mean it. Standard units, like what you see here, are good for horizontal line angle changes up to 30 degrees. Uh, this particular one is PLP's cushion clamp. There are other designs based on this concept, but they have a bolted housing and they have some structural reinforcing rods, meaning armor rods. But they tend to be short, especially compared to the next type, which is AGS. So, excuse me. So they're around 36 inches, so three feet. Advantages. Uh, again, it balances the support function, which is what the clamp is supposed to be doing with the ease of installation. Very economical, good availability, and again, multiple sources. Uh, disadvantages, none. The other type of suspension clamp is armor grip suspension, known commonly as AGS type. These are excellent in terms of supporting the cable. They're uh, economical, readily available, multiple sources. Traditionally for OPGW, there was a layer of structural reinforcing rods applied first. Remember the formed wire dead end? You had a layer of just rods and then you put the dead end body on over top of it. Similar concept here. There would be a layer of armor rods and then you were putting an AGS clamp over top of that. That layer of rods was called the structural reinforcing rods. Now with the stranded stainless steel tube type OPGW design, you can use just a single layer version of this cable. So you don't need the layer of structural reinforcing rods of the cable. You can just use a dead end. Now, you can't use a conductor AGS. Why not? Well, that's because in the US, OPGW is left hand lay but conductor is right hand light. So you can't just go get grab a conductor AGS unit that's sized for your OPGW diameter because it's made for right hand lay conductor, not left hand lay OPGW. If you did that, the part would not have good slip strength. So that would not be a good thing to do. So for that type of OPGW uh, cable, you do have that option. But for center tube type OPGW or aluminum pipe type OPGW, you really should stick with the traditional two layer design. Uh, the disadvantage of this type of suspension unit 
is putting on two layer of rods and they tend to be longer, you know, on the order of four feet or so. Uh, they, it, it takes longer to install. Uh, within the last few years in the market, I've seen no rod type clamps, which are kind of a variation of that bolted uh, clamp design. And uh, I, I don't like them at all. Um, I really should have put the red Mike Riddle kiss of death up here. Um, but I'm not quite as averse to them as I, as I am that sliding wedge type of dead end. Um, but I don't think these are a good idea. And here's where I keep telling and talking about rods. Here's where that comes into play. If you dust off your copy of the EPRI Red Book, you'll see that 75% of lightning strikes occur at or near a structure. And so if I'm having a lightning strike at or near a structure and I have rods on that, that means some of those strikes might hit the tower, or some of those strikes might hit the housing, but some of the strikes might hit the armor rods. And that provides then backup protection for my cable, which is relatively expensive. So if I have 100 strikes that hit the cable, I'm gonna have a certain amount of failures, right? Because the, the cable is designed essentially for a certain amount of charge transfer. But mother nature has a way of always making a bigger lightning strike with more charge than anything you can design for. It turns out that the armor rods that are used with the AGS or the bolted type of cushion clamp are larger than the wires that are used in most OPGW even. So you're essentially getting at least some protection in the vicinity of where you have the most lightning strikes. So you're reducing your chances of a cable failure, which I think is cheap insurance, in my opinion. In addition, with these type of clamps, some of them limit that horizontal line angle change to only 20 degrees instead of the standard 30 degrees for a standard suspension unit. Uh, that complicates your logistics because you, know, you buy these for angles up to 20 degrees, but then you need to buy a standard suspension unit for angles between 21 and 30 degrees. And then you gotta do whatever you were gonna do for uh, angles larger than 30 degrees. I also want to give you some concept to think about the so-called advantages of savings with these types of clamps, because that's what their stated advantage is, is that they're going to save you money. Well, if you look at it, I think the cost savings per unit is on the order of 10 bucks. And the time savings of having to install the rod is going to be on the order of about 10 minutes. So if your OPGW is costing you around a buck a foot, might be a little bit more, but it could, excuse me, might be a little bit less, but it could be a little bit more and substantially more if you've got a higher fiber count cable. So if you grind the math, you're going to find that the savings is on the order of 2% for a system that you want to last 40 years. So, you know, sorry, I think that's, you know, that's chump change. Uh, for in return for what? You're accepting a lot of additional risk, in my opinion, uh, to do this. And then my opinion is also rooted in the school of hard knocks. I've been in the industry a long time. From the back of my memory, there was a clamp in the uh, late 70s, early 80s that was a rodless suspension shoe for a conductor. And it was popular for a few years. It, the design of the clamp was supposed to mitigate aeolian vibration. And uh, people bought that. In fact, the supplier even said, you don't need to use vibration dampers with it because the clamp is going to mitigate um, <clears throat> aeolian vibration damage on its own. And instead, what, what actually happened in five, 10, maybe 15 years in some cases, conductors were experiencing fatigue damage. And so all those clamps eventually got taken down and that product is in the dustbin of history. Uh, it's my belief that this product too will be in the dustbin of history in five, 10, maybe 15 years. Uh, conclusion, I don't use these. 
and I suggest that you not use them either. Unless maybe you're planning to retire in five, 10 years, and you don't like the guy who you think is going to take your job, and uh, you want to leave him a headache. I, I can make an exception for that. Tangent supports. Sometimes you don't have uh, um, the uh, a, a suspension. Uh, the tower isn't designed for that. Uh, you see this in a few parts of the United States, and you see this elsewhere in the world, and that requires a trunnion. Uh, the most common one that I'm familiar with and, it, and common is relative, because these aren't used a lot, isn't, is based on the AGS suspension unit. It's just designed to fit into a bracket. Uh, there's a standard for that bracket, uh, but in the past, I found it hard to actually source, but I did identify these two over the years, so I thought I would list them here in case you ever ran across this. But I strongly prefer suspensions anyway, because a suspension clamp allows articulation. And what I really mean is a little bit of swing left or right. And it only takes a little to alleviate a significant tension imbalance, which you can get when you have a long span on one side and a relatively short span on the other. And that difference gets um, amplified under wind and ice loading conditions. A suspension clamp will move to alleviate that imbalance, and it only takes a little to alleviate a lot. When you use a trunnion clamp like this, it's the trunnion clamp and the cable and the support, they're essentially just um, sucking it up to endure that imbalance. And I just don't think that's good for the cable long-term, so uh, I strongly prefer the the uh, suspension design concept. Double suspensions. So double suspensions pick up from where single suspensions leave off. So they were, uh, they finished at 30 degrees. So a double suspension, you can go from 30 to 60 degrees. You've got the same two options as you had for single suspensions. You've got your bolted. This particular picture is from a PLP cushion clamp again. And uh, you've got your AGS type. Uh, these work fine. I have nothing against them, but I have noticed that sometimes this yoke plate, which is a big chunk of steel, can get quite pricey. And by the time you add up the, the suspension unit itself, plus the cost of the yoke plate, plus the cost of your attachment hardware, you might actually find it's cheaper to just double dead end. And you can double dead end without having a splice point. People sometimes call that a running dead end. And that actually might be cheaper and easier to install, as a matter of fact, too, than using a double suspension. But there's nothing wrong with them. They work great. I've used them myself. All of the preceding dead ends and suspension clamps and double suspension clamps, you've got to connect using pole line hardware to the structure. What do you use? Well, for dead ends, what's been typical is a clevis eye extension link, like this one or this one. Uh, or you could use an extension link, a simple extension link, uh, with an anchor shackle. So the anchor shackle attaches in one hole and it goes to the structure, and then the other hole fits into your dead end. For suspension, you got what seems like a lot of options, but basically what's common is to use a Y clevis I or a Y clevis I90. Which one you use depends upon the orientation of the attachment point. So that'll become some a detail that you have to check. But you have other options. You could use just a plain clevis I, or you could even just use an anchor shackle, or to, if the um, if one anchor shackle isn't in the right plane, you can add add another, use two anchor shackles. Uh, all of these work. So what should you use? Well, here are my guidelines based upon uh, order of importance. First of all, you have to verify that whatever connection hardware you're going to use fits with the accessory. So if I go back up here, I won't use that one. I'll use this one. Uh, you see there's a gap here. 
and the manufacturer will provide information to tell you how much space you have here to work with. And obviously this is a Y clevis that's been used. Uh, the thickness of the member here has to fit within the space that's available. It's that simple. It's a detail that you gotta check. Like I say, it all it has to fit in there, and plus it has to be consistent with the orientation of the attachment point. And if that mistake gets made, usually you can easily correct it with an anchor shackle, because that allows you to turn 90 degrees. So first, make sure the hardware fits. Check that it's consistent with the orientation of the attachment point. Then look at what your company already stocks. If something works, I would use it. You know, why introduce a new item? Uh, next consideration is price and availability. And then there is some allowance for use what you like. There's nothing wrong with any of the ones that I pointed out before, and maybe you've got something different. Um, I have no objection to, the, to another solution. Pick, pick what you like. Some people ask me about uh, using just a plain cotter pen versus a, a bolt nut cotter pen. So if I go back, you can see this particular anchor shackle has a, uh, a bolt, a nut, and a cotter pin. Uh, this clevis eye just has a cotter pin. My experience, just a plain cotter pin works fine, but uh, I don't object to using the bolt nut cotter pin. Some people think this is more secure, that the cotter pin can't uh, back out. Or even if it does back out, the bolt's going to hold the part in place. But as I say, I've just never experienced cotter pins backing out and actually causing real world problems. Grounding, sometimes called bonding. You have two options, copper uh, bonding straps is what they're often called versus aluminum bonding straps. Both are fine. Uh, you might have a, a free end where you're using a PG clamp or something like that to connect to uh, either on a wood pole, like to connect to a bonding wire running down the pole, or it could be a clamp to connect to some attachment point uh, on a structure if it's a lattice tower or a steel pole. Uh, aluminum is the same thing. Both would have a compression terminal. Typically, the compression terminal, I said, say both would have at least one compression terminal to connect to the accessory. Uh, so the, the dead ends will have like an attachment point for your grounding, likewise your suspension clamps. It's different ways depending upon the part item, the particular part, but there's always some way means of attaching a bonding wire to the accessory. You can add a second terminal, again, if that's appropriate for the tower design. Um, it's really that simple. If you plan for it, you can do it uh, with a two terminal grounding strap. Uh, whether you use copper or aluminum is really up to you. The objection to copper is, well, that's introducing a dissimilar metal. In my experience, I've never seen that actually cause any kind of problem with galvanic corrosion. Uh, I'm sure it probably exists somewhere, but I'm just, I've not encountered it. But I have encountered a significant number, not overwhelming number, in fact, I could even say a small number, but nonetheless significant of aluminum straps breaking due to long-term uh, fatigue damage but not aeolian vibration damage, just the wind sway moving the cable back and forth, causing the suspension clamp to move back and forth, causing the bonding assembly to move back and forth. And eventually that movement, that wiggling, uh, causes the strands to begin to break at the mouth of the uh, terminal. So I've seen that and I've never seen this. So I've slight preference to the copper bonding straps, but officially both are okay. Next up, vibration dampers. You have uh, two choices. First up is spiral vibration dampers, generally called SVDs. The, uh, they're made out of uh, 
uh, PVC typically, and they have a gripping section and then the part that actually damps. These work amazingly. They're highly effective. Um, I've been in PLP's vibration span and you vibrate a cable and then you put one of these on and it stops the vibration immediately like magic. It's really uh, very effective and they're very economical. You have very simple protection plans, typically two per span up to 800 feet, four per span up to 1600, six per span up to 2400. And placement doesn't matter. They can go anywhere. I should have put that up here. Placement doesn't matter. They're easy to install, although they can be long. You can install them from a pole because you can kind of corkscrew them on. And you can nest two or three together. So that makes it really easy. This is a picture of two SVDs that have been nested together. But they do have one disadvantage, and that is that you can't use them if the cable OD is greater than 0.75 inches. Now, probably 99% of OPGWs are smaller than 0.75 inches, so it's not often a problem with OPGW, but uh, you know, it is something to be, be aware of. You can only use it up to three quarters of an inch. Your other option is a stock bridge damper. This is a kind of a typical, what's called a four response or four frequency response stock bridge type damper. That's a term about how, how the damper responds over the full frequency range that it might experience in the, in the field. Uh, Stockbridge dampers have, have their advantages. They are effective on all cable sizes, and it's in fact the only choice if the cable OD is greater than three quarters of an inch. They do have some disadvantages. One is the cost. Uh, second one is that often damper suppliers will want you to install these over a short set of armor rods like you see in the illustration here. So that becomes another item you have to buy and another item you have to install. And their protection plans are more complicated. So as you see in this particular picture, if you have a dead end, this is my favorite uh, U-bolt type dead end, uh, you're gonna have to install two. And that's just because of the way these function relative to SVDs. They are also sensitive to placement. So you have to get a dimension from the damper supplier, he'll tell you to put it X number of inches, maybe 20 inches from the end of the dead end. So your crews have to measure that out, mount the clamp there. And then this, in this case, the second damper, it'll have a different dimension, maybe 24 inches, and you have to measure that out and install that damper. Um, and if you say, well, I don't care about that. I'm just gonna put it somewhere on the cable. Surely it does something. Uh, but actually, it turns out that these can be completely ineffective if they're placed at the wrong location. So they are very sensitive to placement. It's very important that you mount them the way the manufacturer tells you to. Some additional thoughts about dampers. So regardless of which type you use, I recommend that you coordinate the damper analysis and protection plan with both the cable and the damper suppliers. A lot of people will only check in with the damper supplier and you really need to bring the cable guy in to my opinion. You also need to be aware that there are some terrains and some conditions, we'll get to the conditions in a minute, but there are some terrain that is more conducive to the smooth laminar wind flow that you need uh, to have alien vibration and in particular for aeolian vibration to be a big problem, um, you need this smooth laminar wind flow. And that's gonna require you to use more dampers. It could be 50% more, it could even be you know, double the quantity. So river crossings, canyon crossings, and any terrain that's very flat with nothing to break up the wind, like trees or buildings. Um, you know, here I live in Texas, you know, in West Texas, we have a lot of this. So in those conditions, um, again, you got to work with the damper supplier. Don't just follow the standard plan, in my opinion. There are some additional guidelines that I can give you. The, 
the benchmark that you should use is the final everyday tension, meaning no ice, no wind at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. If that tension is less than 10% rated breaking strength of the cable, you don't need dampers. You could still put them on, won't hurt anything. Again, cheap insurance as a concept, but you don't really need them. If your tension is between 10 and 15, dampers are a good idea. Again, cheap, cheap insurance. Strictly speaking, um, you're probably not going to have alien vibration, but you could. So cheap insurance. If the tension is above 15 to 20 percent, dampers are absolutely required, no doubt about it. If the tension is above 20 percent, but less than 25 percent, you should double up. Um, this is kind of high. I myself recommend that designers keep tension below 20 percent because of this very reason. The cable is beginning to get very tight and it makes it very susceptible to aeolian vibration and in particular aeolian vibration damage. And at this point, it's absolutely critical to confirm the protection plan with both the cable and the damper suppliers. And if your tension is above 25 percent, uh, you're in the danger zone. In the U.S., you're flat out outside the NESC guidelines, uh, excuse me, code. Uh, just don't go there. Um, I guess I see this situation more often outside the United States. So ideally, keep it below 20% rated breaking strength. And by the way, this is true for any aerial metal cable. So conductor works the same way. Good, good guidelines to use. And by the way, if you say, well, what about an all steel cable? You know, it. It's not really going to have aeolian vibration damage, is it? And then I'm going to tell you, well, as a matter of fact, probably not. Steel ha can endure much more uh, bending uh, fatigue than aluminum can. But at that point in the real world, what happens is you have damage to the hardware, even damage to structures. So it doesn't really matter what cable type it is. These are good guidelines to use. And then. Just for fun, here are some pictures of that I found of alien vibration damage. So here, there was a suspension clamp installed over this conductor, and the damage was right at the mouth on both sides. Uh, similar situation here, you can see the strands have popped. It is uh, common, so here in this picture, you see the mouth of a suspension shoe, and some of the outer strands have been cut and then um, bended, unstranded back to expose the wires underneath. This does happen where the outside does not show any damage, but there are broken strands on the inside. So this is like a two layer conductor probably. And the outside is okay, but the inside has damage. You would see that in the form of like this black residue, like you see here and here. So um, after the ends break, uh, there would be some uh, rubbing that would create like an aluminum oxide powder that would kind of um, manifest itself on the outside of the cable like you see in the two up here. Uh, Reform line products uh, published in TND World, a good uh, primer on aeolian vibration. So here I've put the, the link to that. So you can go read that and learn more about aeolian vibration. So at your splice points, you're going to have down lead clamps, well, dead ends, because we already talked about those. Uh, but you're going to have down lead clamps and then a splice enclosure. So we're going to talk about those. So down lead clamps, like you see in this picture here, the cable has come in, looks like a formed wire type dead end and then it's brought down to go down to the structure to the actual splice enclosure. Here you see a down lead clamp that's been installed using a banding adapter. You got two basic types of down lead clamps. You got aluminum and plastic, both work fine. I myself prefer the aluminum. That's because I just sort of have this thing metal for metal. For ADSS, I prefer the plastic ones because it's plastic to plastic. But uh, in theory, Either type is okay. You have lots of mounting options. So you've got a lag screw, 
Incidentally, that's what you see here. Here you just see a bolt. But a lag screw, that's good for wood poles. The banding adapter, like we saw in the picture here, Banding adapters are very versatile. You can use them on steel poles. It's very common for steel poles, but you could use it on a wood pole and a concrete pole too. No problem with that. Lattice towers, you have special lattice tower adapters. There are lots of different designs out there. You can kind of use the same guidelines that I said about the connecting hardware. See what your company uses and use that, or you can look around and find something else that you like. For metal and concrete poles, you could just use a bolt, like here. But obviously, there has to be a female interface on the structure, which means you had to have put that in uh, when you were having the structure fabricated. Splice enclosures, lots of different splice enclosures on the market today. So I could do a separate webinar just on splice enclosures. Today, we're just gonna hit some of the highlights. So dome types are like what you see here on the left. So the housing is designed such that the inside of the enclosure where the splice trays are goes up from the bottom. So you only have to seal around the bottom of the enclosure. And that also means that rain and whatnot is going to tend to just go down the splice enclosure and just fall off, not really exposed to the area that's trying to seal the inside from that outside environmental condition. And this is probably today's most popular type of enclosure. But uh, before dome types, clamshell types were very popular. It's a classic design. They still work great. There are lots of variations on this. They vary a lot in size. This is a rel like a medium-sized one, but there were big ones. You had this one that was made with a stainless steel outer housing, different shapes. This one happens to be a PLP's Coyote Runt. It's for low fiber count cables. It works great. But the thing about these is that the ceiling occurs over a much greater distance. And in theory, it's not as well protected from uh, water coming from rain or wherever, um, as is the dome type. You also have a cast type. This is a very old design um, that lingers on for whatever reason. I guess because people have used it before and they got used to it and they want to keep using it. Which type to use? Well, I've already alluded to this. The dome type offers the best seal, which means no leaks. And remember, water and fiber don't mix long term. In contrast to the dome type, the cast type has the worst seal. Uh, I don't know of any studies that I could cite to prove that, but I have a lot of anecdotal evidence of lots of leaks. And in fact, uh, in the industry on time, at one point I worked for a company, I made that type, and I personally fielded the phone calls from customers calling to complain about water inside their splice enclosures. And as recently as a few weeks ago, I was meeting with a customer who still had some of these up, and he pointed out that every couple of years they had to go open them up to drain out the water in them. Uh, I, so it happens. I, I think you don't want water inside your splice enclosure, so I would never use them. Plus, they're not well suited for prepping a cable in a controlled environment because either you have to mount them first, and some utilities do that. They'll mount them on the fir uh, first because they're very heavy, right? Because they're made out of cast uh, iron. Uh, that's been galvanized, although the the lid may be aluminum uh, for some of them. Uh, but they're either way, they're very heavy. So you mount them first, you take off the cover, what you see here, uh, and then you bring the cable in, strip off the outer wires, and bring the optical core down to where you're doing the splicing. But now your optical core is exposed to whatever the weather condition is. If it's a nice day, that's great. But what if it's not? So 
Um, not good. Then you have to do your splicing and then roll everything up and cram it back into the enclosure. Um, I just never liked that. Um, and your option is to splice this whole thing, not slice, but splice in a controlled environment, right? So you take the whole thing, you splice it down here, and then you got to try to lift this heavy thing. I mean, they can weigh over 100 pounds and uh, hoist it up on a pole and put it in place. Not easy to do. So as I say, I, I don't care for those. The clamshell types are fine. They're somewhere in between in terms of uh, leak performance. Other considerations about your splice enclosures are what kind of trays do you want to use? Uh, today, 24 fiber trays coordinate well with most of today's OPGW designs, but you can use whatever you like or more particularly what your splice, pack, splice techs like. Uh, cable storage, like what you see in the picture here, is a good idea. As I say here, can you ever have too much spare cable? And if you know that you're in an area where there are people that are shooting weapons and they like to shoot things like splice enclosures, you may need the bullet resistant outer housing. Uh, this is one particular design here. Here's another type. Use what you like, or again, maybe what your utility has already used. So uh, in addition to alien vibration, you can have galloping. And galloping is another form of wind-induced motion. It's especially damaging. So aeolian vibration is high frequency, low amplitude. Galloping, in contrast, is low frequency, high amplitude. Uh, amplitude can be feet, even. Uh, so it can be very severe and very damaging to cable and structures. You can mitigate this with preformed line products, Air Force spoilers, which looks like this. What it does is it's varying the cross section that the wind sees as it's blowing across the cable. And as a consequence of that, it's disrupting the lift that the wind would otherwise create. And as I say here, I consider this the only proven mitigation method. There are others that are claimed solutions out there. Uh, I doubt their effectiveness and their reliability. Uh, again, PLP has a good primer on this that you can find at this link. Another thing that you might need is bird diverters. Um, birds, especially large migratory species, can hit aerial cables. Uh, when I, I tried to find out, you know, exactly why is that? Right here, I found a picture here, a bunch of birds. They obviously didn't have trouble landing on this cable. Um, what I found is that it's the young birds that haven't really developed good flight control that hit cables and then get injured. Uh, two other possibilities are flying while under the influence or texting while flying. Uh, you know, these were just my ideas. This is what I actually found when researching this. So only one of these is really true. And then the little joke here. So the center bird is giving a safety briefing to his fellow birds on how to avoid crashing into cables. So what can you do? Well, in theory, education, but birds don't attend these webinars. And plus, I don't speak a bird song. So uh, there's that. Shotguns would be effective. But of course, they have uh, bad effects on the birds and on the cable. So I can't recommend that. So. What's left is bird flight diverters. And there are designs out there. These are from PLP. So they have their bird flight diverter, uh, which apparently works with most birds except swans, because they also have their swan flight diverter. So I guess swans don't see this, but they do see this. And then they've got diverters for raptors and owls. Um, here's one with a cool LED thing, because I guess owls fly at night to you know, light them up. Uh, anyway, contact PLP. If that's a problem in your area with birds hitting cables, you can save some birds and help Mother Earth by using bird flight diverters on your cable. Marker balls. Uh, marker balls in some areas are very important because we don't want aircraft um, flying into our cables. And you know, UFOs, you don't want flying into your cables either. So. 
use them where they're needed. But I, I wanted to give you some comments because they do have significant weight and so they do need to be factored into your SAG intention calculations. SAG 10 and PLS CAD both do that. And uh, I refer you to those programs for details on how you would do that, but just you can do it and you should do it if you need to put these on. For me as a cable supplier, the thing I'm more concerned about though is that you use armor rods. So this picture shows this rod, uh, this marker ball installed directly on a cable. Uh, I think it's better to use the armor rods. Um, the reason is these things are heavy. They can force a node. Go over here. Uh, the reason really has to do with the only vibration because they're heavy. They can force a node and thereby you can end up with damage to strands close to the marker ball. So if you use rods, you're protecting the cable, giving it some support. And then in addition to that, you should treat the subspans created as separate spans for purposes of aeolian vibration protection. So the example, it's easier to illustrate what I mean with an example. So if you had a thousand foot span and you were planning to install two marker balls, evenly spaced, you would have three subspans, right? So it's structure, 330 feet, first marker ball, another 330 feet, second marker ball, 330 feet to the next structure. So three subspans. So you would treat this for vibration protection as three spans of 333 feet each. The standard SVD protection plan, remember from many slides ago, was two per span up to 800 feet. So in this example, you would need six SVDs, three subspans, two per span, six. If you just ignored that and just looked at the thousand foot, you would only be using four because four was good from 800 feet up to 1600 feet, you wouldn't have enough protection. Um, this is the way that you should do it. In this particular illustration, you see that this marker ball was installed on rods. The rods start here and go through the ball. And then there's a stock bridge type damper that's been used in this case to protect this subspan. Presumably there's a stock bridge damper on the far end of the other subspan. Last, repair rods. If your OPGW gets damaged, maybe by a lightning strike or uh, that shotgun damage I referred to earlier, uh, then repair rods can be used. Basically, these are just armor rods uh, with grit to help restore both strength and conductivity. General guideline is that they're good for up to 50% strength 50% of the cable's rated breaking strength. So you need to, again, check with both the repair rod supplier and the cable manufacturer for details on the application. The cable manufacturer can help you calculate the residual strength to make sure that you're meeting this. And then the repair rod supplier is gonna give you the details about what their product is capable of doing. So you, gotta, you need to work with both. Um, but these can be a very inexpensive solution to a, a cable problem when the damage is only mechanical. Obviously, if the optics don't work, you got a bigger problem and you, these won't repair the optics, only the strength and conductivity. Uh, in closing, I just want to mention that when it comes to accessories, we do have our OPGW configurator, part of our advanced cable engineering system. Uh, and it will help you pick accessories. So you can go play with that. And I think you'll, uh, you'll find it very helpful in determining what uh, accessories to use for your product. And it also helps with cable design too. So check that out, please. And that completes today's webinar, or at least this portion, the presentation. Now I'll see if there are any questions. Happy to help with uh, questions. So, I will come over here, chat, uh, let's see, what's in chat? Welcome to do, 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 do. Oops. already to be mumbling. From Gary Smolin, Shearhead 
bolts, do the sheared pieces generally drop to the ground, possibly hitting someone? Well, yeah, that when you shear them off, they absolutely could fall to the ground and possibly hit somebody. Um, hadn't thought about that before, but that's a, a an excellent point. And I see somebody has posted in chat the the uh, links that were in my uh, presentation. So that's probably an easier way for you to get that. And then let's see, now in the official Q&A area, you can submit questions there too. And somebody says they lost sound. Uh, well, that's bad. I don't know what to do about that if you can hear me. Uh, uh, is this presentation being recorded and will it be available to us? Yes, it will be. And let's see, how do I answer that? And then type, uh, select the question. Uh, yes, the presentation is being recorded and uh, we can send you a link to it. I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Oh, somebody did answer that. <laughs> yes, okay, so that was answered too. There's another answer there. Um, we've seen cotter pins that were worn through by vibration and subsequently fell, dropping the conductor, also spreading and fracturing over wide clevis by high tension is prevented by the nut and cotter pin. Joe Rinaldo, thank you for your input. I. Um, I fully respect your your input. When I say that I've not encountered something, that does not mean that I believe that I have encountered everything in the known universe in this regard. I'm just saying I haven't seen it. It seemed like it worked. Um, but I defer to your experience, uh, which is even more expensive, expensive than my own. And so I, I don't object uh, to using the bolt nut cotter pen. And on, on it, it does intuitively seem like it would be the more secure of the two options, but I don't object to using just a plain cotter pen. I guess that's my real point. Yeah, thanks, Joe. <laughs> Very rare. Yeah, I mean, but you know, just because it's rare doesn't mean that prevention shouldn't be used because as you know, in our industry, when you have a problem, it can be really expensive to, to fix it. And the bolt nut cotter pin, I don't know how much cost it adds. Maybe it adds a dollar to the cost of a part. Um, you can make the case it's, that it's uh, therefore, again, another form of cheap insurance. Why not use it? And I would accept that, uh, that thinking, no problem. So any other comments or questions, I should say? Questions, comments? Well, Mike, there is a question in chat. Oh, in chat. Okay, let me pull that over here. Chat, chat, chat. Attaching downly clamp on poles with straps. Uh, do you mean, I'm not sure I understand the question, um, Tufik. Are you, are you saying attaching the clamps with uh, bands, like banding adapters. I'm okay with that. Yes, he means that this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I and I, I will say this. I've I know one customer in the United States that decided he didn't need, need any dang stinking down lead clamps, he was just going to band directly on the cable. <laughs> I, you know, it worked. I didn't, I didn't particularly care for it. My concern would be that the guy installing the banding could uh, over tighten it or not tighten it enough. So over tighten it might damage the cable to under tighten it means it might not really secure the cable like you want it to, but you could do it. Um, I prefer the use of the uh, uh, the down lead clamps. 
if if you're asking if you could just strap over a down lead clamp, um, yeah, I suppose you could do that. But uh, it seems to me that it would be easier to just buy a down lead um, a banding adapter and work. Uh, someone says, I thought the Stockbridge damper also took care of galloping. And uh, yes, you are quite wrong. The Stockbridge damper would do nothing against galloping. Um, and in fact, uh, there's been a problem in some cases with when there has been galloping, that the galloping has been severe enough to cause the weights to come off. And so now you've got this uh, several pound uh, weight flying through the air for, you know, on the order of 100 feet to ground, a very, very dangerous. Um, not that they do that in general. Uh, some designs are more susceptible to that than others. So you need to make sure that you're using a reputable quality uh, damper supplier. Okay. Um, looks like I'm not seeing any other uh, questions or chats. And we are coming up on 15 minutes past the hour. So I think we'll go ahead and close out for today. I appreciate everybody's uh, um, attending your time and attention today. I appreciate the questions. And um, if you think of something later, let us know. Everyone who attended will receive an email. And the email has several things in it. If you want to get your RCEP continuing education credits, the email will have a link where you can go and you take a simple test. There's 10 questions. Uh, if you paid attention, you should be able to answer them easily. You have to get 70% and then you earn your RCEP credits. Uh, we do that through their website, their portal. Uh, so you go to the link, take the test, um, pass with 70% and we'll post your credits through RCEP. Uh, there'll be another link for you to give us a uh, feedback, a survey. So please tell us what you think. You know, we're always open to ideas and I'm always open to constructive criticism, how I could make these better and more useful to you, right? Because I'm doing them for you. Um, not just for myself, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, benefit our industry. So give us some feedback. The third thing that's going to be there is what I alluded to earlier. There's a link where you can find the recording of this. So you, you know, you can uh, listen to it again, right? If you're having trouble sleeping one night, you know, go pull, pull up a micro to webinar and you can listen to them and they will cure your insomnia. Um, or you could share it with a colleague and maybe get an attend today. So there are uh, different possibilities there. And with that, I'll close on that note. Again, thank you for your time and attention and participation today. And uh, I hope that you have a great rest of the day and a super week. Take care and good day.